Data 10 Spring Trap. Now, this number is really meta and that's why it's starting off the list. But this isn't a metaphorical or philosophical number as if like if you thought it was going to be. Springtrap has literally killed other versions of himself in the Fazbear Frights story of In the Flesh from the fifth Fazbear Frights book Bunny Call. After Matt hadn't play tested a VR game he was working on for a few days called Springtrap's Revenge, he came back to find piles of dead spring traps that the AI had somehow spawned in order to have something to kill. It's absolutely horrifying and it's just plain weird. Like why would you spawn more versions of yourself in order to have something to kill? Like isn't that just like a paradox? Like like how you physically are unable to prevent yourself from being born since if you do the you you fade out of existence, but then you can't go back and prevent it. So like you can't you can't stop yourself from being born because then you can't stop yourself from being born. I mean, I, well, depending on what theories about time travel that you believe, whether you believe Back to the Future or Endgame. That also makes it impossible for your younger siblings to prevent you from being born, um, but the older ones can prevent the younger ones because they'd still be alive uh, before you were conceived. So uh, watch out, Jordan. And at nine, Hudson. Hudson is the protagonist of What We Found, the third story in the 8th Fazbear Frights book Gumdrop Angel. Hudson has short blonde hair with a pale beard and blue eyes. He also has straight white teeth. He has bruises and burns all over his body. He's 6'1 and skinny. Almost like me, except my teeth aren't white and I'm not 6'1 and I don't have a beard. But I have blue eyes and I'm skinny. <laughs> Hudson is a security guard at the upcoming horror attraction of Fazbear's Fright. His life up to this point has been filled with nothing but tragedy. His father committed suicide and his mother remarried a man named Lewis who would physically abuse Hudson at nearly every chance he got. He also became the main target for bullies who would hold his head down while flushing a toilet. Hudson began to fail school and instead of trying to help him, the teachers would instead call him names and tell him that he's dumb. Gotta love the public school system, am I right? The story would later reveal that Hudson's family home burned down with Lewis and his mother inside, killing them. While Hudson does burn in an oven at the end of the story, he was in essence driven there by Springtrap, who was the main antagonist of the story. So still a Springtrap victim. By the way, Hudson was also the one who set the fire that killed his mom and Lewis, so. In a day, Jeremy. There aren't many glitch trap victims, so we can't really do one of those lists. But since Jeremy from FNAF VR was driven to suicide by glitch trap, who is William Afton's code form, I think it's close enough to deem a spring trap killing. Jeremy from FNAF VR is the game tester who tested the game before Tape Girl, and is the one who Tape Girl found after he cut off his face using a guillotine paper cutter. This was thanks to William invading Jeremy's mind through the use of the VR game, which is still confusing to me, since like unless you were connected in some form of sword art online haptic suit it shouldn't really be possible we're only seeing the game with our eyes not plugged in like the matrix but I don't know why I'm bothered by it I mean I'm literally talking about a game series where a man possessed by the spirit of a child exploded after somehow communicating while comatose had then used his intense agony to possess a hard drive that then gets scanned to create an AI that allows this man to continue living so I don't know why I'm getting caught up in semantics honestly but yeah Jeremy. And it's 7, Vanny. Vanny is the planned main antagonist of the next FNAF game Security Breach. There is not much we know about Vanny, but there are plenty of theories. Some believe Vanny to be the glitch trap controlled version of Vanessa, which would make sense. Some also believe that she was the girl who recorded the tapes in FNAF VR, aptly referred to as Tape Girl, who I literally just mentioned, which would also make sense. And while both of these are probably true, even if they aren't, somehow Vanny did fall under William's control, which in essence makes her a spring trap victim. Even if it was Lit trap who was controlling her, but he also would have manifested in that suit because he didn't want to relive the agony of being spring locked, so he was still basically spring trap. Look, this was a hard list, okay? And I had to add this number at the end. I, I had to add it so that I had 10 points, okay? So chill for a minute and let me do my thing. And it's six, Charlie. Okay, so in a way, Charlie in the Twisted Ones novel is a victim of Springtrap. And by in a way, I'm gonna have to suspend my disbelief because she was still a robot. While the original Charlie was killed by William Afton, in the Twisted Ones, one of the four robotic versions of Charlie gets snatched by a twisted animatronic and gets killed. Which only makes things more confusing when another version of Charlie, who is much older, shows up. But that's not the point. The point is that at this point, William had become Springtrap, and the twisted animatronics were his invention. So while yes, she was a robot, she was still a sentient robot who got snatched by an Afton creation after he had become Springtrap, so that's good enough for me. This was, like I said, 
actually harder than I thought it was going to be. William doesn't do much killing after becoming Springtrap because he's locked in a room for 30 years. Most of the damage was already done at that point. So please forgive a few leaps in logic or suspension of disbelief. Please. Thank you. Halfway through it at number five, William Afton. William is at number five because, well, he absolutely did deserve to be a Springlock victim, uh, but he also actually was, and seemingly is the only one who actually was on this list. But like for real, this man deserved what he got in more ways than one. Seriously, he was a mass murderer who would have gotten a lethal injection anyway, but also the technician that made the suits, the man that handles the suit maintenance on the daily, and is absolutely explained to every single employee that has put one of these fuckers on the proper procedure for the spring lock suits. Mostly for tax and liability reasons, probably, okay? But including the spring bonnie suit that he uses to kill people, okay? Then he gets inside one without thinking and somehow doesn't notice the moisture in the room. The leaking ceiling causing the spring locks that were active at this moment to fail and just fill him full of metal, okay? But like, it's your building, my guy. How are you not painfully aware of the leaking ceiling in this back room? Really? Like, how? How do you not know? S seriously, somehow, this lucky motherfucker managed to get possessed by someone that he killed who was so pissed at him that they kept him alive for all of his other supposed supposed to be deaths that because they wanted William to suffer. Like, God damn it. No matter who it is, whether you believe it was Crying Child or Cassidy, despite there being a more logical conclusion when you don't just blindly listen to MatPat, like, why? Why couldn't you just let him die? I get that you want him to suffer, okay, obviously. I mean, I put him on this list. I wanted him to be spring long. But like, doing that results in him killing more people. So why? Why would you do that? In it for Vanessa. I feel like this one is kind of obvious, uh, and you may get mad at me for saying this, but Vanessa deserves to be spring locked, man, okay? You're probably thinking, but she's possessed, you moron. She doesn't have control over her actions. But that's the thing. She does. Vanessa has no willpower to sacrifice herself for the greater good, okay? At this point, I think that it's safe to, to infer that Jeremy from FNAF VR didn't go crazy because he just saw a glitch trap. It's fairly reasonable to say that he got possessed. Tape Girl hadn't broken glitch trap into the tapes yet, and he was probably just able to possess whoever he wanted. So if Jeremy did get possessed, and the possession worked in a similar way that it does with Vanessa, which would make sense, Jeremy would at times be sentient and in control of his own body. So if he knew about about glitch trap. Maybe he didn't cut his face off because he was freaking out like he had just taken like the um, Epsom salt because you use it in the bath. Maybe maybe he did it to try and kill the monster that was inside of him. Okay, so if Vanessa had the gall, Afton wouldn't really have a vessel. Okay, especially since the VR game at this point was probably abandoned. But she won't. But she won't do it. So she deserves to be spring locked. Getting close to the end into number three, Gregory. The way I see it, Gregory is such a stuck up little shit that he would absolutely deserve to be crushed by metal robotic bits being put in the same place as his bones. Because this kid is just a damn menace that seemingly doesn't want to take responsibility for any of his actions. And you know what? None of you hold him accountable either. Gregory orders the robots to disassemble Vanny. Uh, quote, okay? Gregory being willing to kill Vanny is already pretty messed up, but while some would argue self-defense, this is not self-defense. Self-defense requires a reasonable amount of force to be used, okay? Tearing a person limb from limb is not reasonable force. This kid is easily able to destroy all three animatronics without a moment's hesitation and then use their upgrades on Freddy. He is willing to kill Vanny, like I said, despite actually seemingly knowing her like we see in the best ending. And then he burns Burn Trap multiple times in an attempt to stop him from taking control over Freddy. Um, but again, he's also just setting fire to this thing all the time. So like, what the absolute living hell is this kid doing? And how is he so nonchalant about this whole thing? Okay, this guy literally kills Vanny and then only gets emotional when he has to go talk to a destroyed Freddy robot that they can remake. Dude, Vanny is literally bleeding out right next to you. I'm sure that her, her ribs are just splayed across the floor. Dude, couldn't you have just said like stop Vanny or restrain Vanny? Stop Vanny would have been the easiest one, not freaking disassemble, okay? You're not panicking about literally anything else in this game, okay? Just, just say something that doesn't involve a human dying for God's sakes, okay? Stop Vanny, like, dude. And ultimately, in number two, Henry. Yes, I'm going to continue the Henry hate train. Choo-choo, get on board, mother 
years because despite how many people try and defend him, I will never stand down. I don't get what Henry's deal is because he does not kill William at any point in the series aside from trying to make it look like a fire did it. But William is already considered dead. How would you killing him make things suspicious? So why would you try to cover it up with a fire? For some reason, okay, he seems to be fine offing William's son when he gets the chance, though. I mean, in both of the fires that Henry has set that we see, FNAF 3 and FNAF 6, Michael was there both times. And he didn't seem to care that Michael was in the building either time, okay? He doesn't even give Michael the opportunity to leave in FNAF 6, despite there having been a way out planned. Quote from Henry's final speech. And to you, my brave volunteer, who somehow found this job listing not intended for you. Although there was a way out planned for you, I have a feeling that that's not what you want. I have a feeling that you are right where you want to be. You have a feeling? What are you, the black guy frickin' peas? He assumes that we also want to die in these halls, but doesn't give us the chance to actually make that decision for ourselves. He just forces us to die, since he doesn't give us a way out, okay? That's murder, <laughs> whether we wanted it or not. Okay, assisted suicide is still illegal in the majority of states, I'm pretty sure, okay? But even then, not giving us the choice, even just assuming that we want it makes it a murder. Instead of like having a f the fire burn the building down or having baby lob his head off, okay? He should have had to suffer a spring log failure just so that he could see how easy it would have been just to, to off Afton directly instead of trying to do it like a coward. And finally, in at number one, Michael Afton. Michael Afton absolutely, in my mind, deserves to have gotten springlocked instead of simply burning in FNAF 6, okay? Like, sure, he seems to be playing the good guy going after his father, but in reality, Michael, to me, he's, he's just playing the hero this whole time and not actually doing anything. He says he's trying to right his father's wrongs and whatnot, but even Oliver Queen did more than that, okay? He's not doing it because he's a good person. He's doing it because he feels bad and not because of, like, some higher moral code. He blames himself for getting his brother killed, which I mean is understandable, but then that subsequently means that anything he does to try and like fix the things that his father did is just to make himself feel better about his own mistakes. Because in the end, nothing is going to bring his little bro back, okay? And he doesn't even really have the stomach to actually stop his father once and for all. He says that he's going to come find him, but then when he does in FNAF 6, he doesn't burn down the place to stop him, okay? Henry does that. Yeah, Henry is the only one who's actually willing to sack up and try to stop William, even if he does it in a cowardly way, okay? It just shows how not serious Michael is. And if he really wanted to make sure that William was dead, he wouldn't have let himself burn in the FNAF 6 fire, okay? But he does. He lets himself burn, or at least doesn't actually successfully get out of the building so that he won't have to feel the regret of hurting his brother anymore, okay? Because he has the curse of knowledge, since he knows what his father was doing, and he just, he doesn't want to deal with it anymore. And you know what? That deserves a spring locking. That's right. I don't care how mad at you, you are at me in the comments. Okay, I don't care. It's true. All right, it's Monday morning. I'm mad. And it's in Henry. Now, there are many ways to consider Henry a victim of Purple Guy, but he's first on the list because not many of them are like as direct as the others on this list. Like while we do see Henry killed by baby in FNAF world, in the main series games he lives on to FNAF 6 where he burns in a fire, supposedly by his own hand. Unless baby kills him before the fire since he like cut her off when she was trying to do her whole thing, but that's just speculation. However, Henry was also the victim of Purple Guy's crimes when Charlotte died as seen in FNAF 2 and FNAF 6, as well as in the books since Henry lost his daughter Charlie to William when she was only three years old. Remember, when someone takes a life, the one who dies isn't the the only victim, all right? Their friends, their family, anyone who loved the victim are victims as well. Okay, so this also extends to Henry's wife, who we don't know the name of as far as I know, since she may not even be alive in the games. So she could also definitely be alive in the movie, um, especially if William and Henry are. So we might even see both. That's a two for one deal on number 10, you're welcome. And at nine, Charlotte. Charlotte is one of the most troublesome victims that purple guy had. Being the first victim, Charlotte gets killed outside Fred Bear's family diner, despite desperate attempts from her father, Henry, to prevent this, mainly by creating a security animatronic designed to be a puppet to protect other kids, but treat her as a priority. Remember the green bracelet thing? However, when it gets trapped in a box, it's unable to make it out to Charlotte in time to save her. So, in another attempt, the puppet saves her in a different way, allowing her agony to reach out and take hold of the animatronic. As the puppet, Charlotte then went on to share her gift of a second chance with the other animatronics, bringing them to life as well, resulting in William's ultimate undoing. So, in a way, Charlotte 
it really is the one you should not have killed, but just like in like a name sense, not in like a character sense. Since if he had spared her, uh, maybe none of the other animatronics would have been alive and he wouldn't have gotten killed or springlocked or whatever. And also if you want to stay up to date on the FNAF movie news, be sure you hit subscribe because as soon as we actually find out something concrete and that wouldn't be like a 30 second video, you'll know. And it ain't Cassidy. Cassidy is probably who you expected to be number one on this list. The generally assumed one you should not have killed, the missing children's victim who went on to possess Golden Freddy, at least if you believe Golden Freddy being an actual animatronic and not a hallucination. Cassidy is described in the novels as a young girl with long black hair, which also is the description of the only human to appear as a picture in the FNAF survival logbook, or security logbook, depending on if you read the crossed out name or not, I call it both. The name Cassidy was also discovered in this book when a theorist going by username dpowerful1, took wrong or highlighted numbers from various pages and put them into the word search as coordinates in essence, which has got to be the most complicated name drop in history, okay? Like we dig through source code, we put like audio files through spectrograms, we put them on reverse and speed them up and trying to find clues, but this was even too much for this series, okay? Like I don't know why you had to go make things so complicated, but timely pop culture references aside, I I don't know if Cassidy's going to be in the movie, uh, given how the screenplay is the Mike screenplay, um, at least going off what Scott said on Reddit years ago. But in that post, he also said that he scrapped the Cassidy screenplay, so I doubt she'll be a major player, but she could still show up. And it's Seven Elizabeth. Elizabeth was an unintentional victim of Purple Guy, given that Elizabeth was, in fact, his daughter. <laughs> yeah. In the aftermath of his murder den closing, Afton sets up shop in a new restaurant he owned and operated called Circus Baby's Pizza World, where the feature animal animatronics were actually giant murder bots hungry for the flesh of children because you know that's what the series has come to <laughs> or at least that's what it had come to and then it got worse. He warned his kids to stay away from the animatronics especially his daughter Elizabeth since she had such a fascination with the main star baby but she didn't listen because of course she didn't she's a goddamn kid and you made the animatronic specifically to attract kids. So in a moment of ultimate regret she ends up getting scooped and insta-killed while baby's arm grabbed her, pulled her in and then like crushed her in her storage unit. Yeah, it was pretty brutal. And while he didn't kill her directly, he still killed her, okay? And then even victimized himself since, you know, it was his daughter that got scooped and the, the friends and family of the victim are also victims. This then leads him to discover his passion, but then this leads him to discover possession and agony and like the the remnant metal thing. So yeah, I don't know how he knows that it was agony that did the possessing, but this then completely changes his m motive. So it's a pivotal death in the Purple Guy chronology, so hopefully it'll be in the movie. And it's six, Gabriel. Gabriel was one of the original five missing children from the first ever incident that we learn about in the games. We believe his soul is passed into the Freddy animatronic based on the gravestone ending and the placement of the FNAF 3 heads. But Gabriel, though, hasn't really ever gotten much of a description, aside from a brief mention in the books. But that description could also be referencing Jeremy, and based on Crying Child from FNAF 4's 8-bit minigames, it could also be him. So there's just not, there's not really much validity to it, but I mean, I don't know, he could still show up. I wonder how Gabriel feels about being the mascot of the company, in essence, which is kind of weird. <laughs> like, he's, he's not getting paid for it. <laughs> and with over 25 versions of the character being present throughout all of the games, I originally had a theory that we played as someone named Gabriel in FNAF VR, since we ended up getting stuffed into a Freddy animatronic at the end of the game. But, uh, yeah, then, then I thought that Gregory from Security Breach was going to be a Gabriel comparison, because, like, you know, whole hiding in Freddy thing, Gabriel's in Freddy, but then he turned into Crying Child, so so who knows? I don't know. Maybe that's who Grant Freely is playing, since it's the supporting character in the movie. Maybe that, I don't know. Halfway through in at number five, William Afton. William does eventually kick the bucket, but even when his physical form dies, he comes back as sentient code in a video game, and isn't that the dream? Either way, this man narrowly avoids dying throughout the whole series. This man was possessed by a spirit that intentionally kept him alive through multiple instances that should have killed him, so I think if anything, this guy is the definition of almost victim. William doesn't even ultimately die until he allows himself to in the Fazbear Warehouse in the Man in Room 1280, and even when his body explodes, he's still surviving through latching 
onto a hard drive that gets scanned into Help Wanted. And I have no doubts that he picked the one that would specifically be used or one that he instructed someone else to use when making the VR game. At least if the game was planned before his demise. Seriously though, William survived a spring locking, the FNAF 3 fire, the FNAF 6 fire, and the constant assassination attempts from the hospital staff. So this guy is for sure making it onto this list. And at 4, Kelsey. Kelsey, in essence, is the main antagonist to the Fazbear Frights story, the new kid from the third Fazbear Frights book, 1.35am. Kelsey had just moved to town and ends up making friends with the protagonist, Devin. Devin ends up getting jealous of how much everyone loves Kelsey, so he hatches a plan with his friend to trap him in a Springlock suit for a few hours. However, when they unleash their plan, the Springlock suit fails and kills Kelsey. At least, so they thought. Since a week later, Devin returns to make sure Kelsey is still there, only to find a different body in the suit. He knows it's someone else because the hair color's different. And then Devin gets stuck in the suit by his arm and bleeds out. Only for the story to cut back to Kelsey meeting two more kids at his new new school. This is an interesting story, because while Kelsey did get springlocked, he ends up being fine. So what happened? Some think that Kelsey's a ghost, some think that he's the one you should not have killed, others don't know. But either way, this version of Kelsey, the one who got into the suit, was nearly a victim that somehow survived or escaped. At least. So we think. Getting close to the end and at number 3, us. We as the player in many of these games narrowly avoid death. Sometimes with ease, sometimes by the skin of our teeth. Like in the baby night terror level of FNAF VR, where we are literally trapped in a closet that baby could open at any time and kill us. Other times are less close, like if we see an animatronic right outside our window in FNAF 1 and need to quickly close the door before it gets us. But either way, there is no denying that we in every FNAF game are almost victims. Sometimes we even are victims, like in FNAF 4 where we die thanks to William pulling the plug, or in Sister Location where he gets scooped and stuffed with Ennard, or FNAF 6 where we willingly allow ourselves to be freed by the cleansing fire. No matter what, it's undeniable that we are some of the most resilient characters in the whole series. Normal people would see what they're up against and then quit day one. And then when asked about it at their next interview, they would say haunted animatronics were trying to kill me, so I quit. Simple as that, no other explanation needed. But we, as the players, stick it out for a week. And instead of quitting, we get fired, because we know what we need to do, and that's pretty admirable. And ultimately, in at number two, Jeremy Fitzgerald. Jeremy Fitzgerald is the character most assumed suffered the bite of 87, a moment that has been debated since the start of the Five Nights series. While yes, this Jeremy may lose his frontal lobe, he could have lost his life. And I don't know about you, but losing my frontal lobe and getting promoted to day shift and suing that company to get a boatload of money sounds a lot better than death to me. Especially since MatPack concluded that one of the only things that would happen would be your loss of self-preservation and fear. Now I have no idea what an entire frontal lobe being removed would do, but it still sounds better than death. Which in my opinion makes this character almost a victim, since if that animatronic had moved even slightly, or Jeremy had been an inch closer, it would, <laughs> it would have been much, much worse than it was. Oh yeah. Finally, in at number one, Casey. Casey is the main character in a Fast Bear Fright story I don't know if I've really talked about in detail. I might have mentioned the story here and there, but I don't think there's been a whole number on it. Casey appears in the Fazbear Frights story Dance With Me from Step Closer, the fourth Fazbear Frights book. She ends up stealing some glasses that when worn either reveal or display a Ballora animatronic dancing. Honestly, this is the first character I put on this list and the reason I thought this list was possible, since this entire story revolves around how she was almost a victim of Ballora. Now don't get me wrong, the story is very unclear in this regard, but it's generally assumed that the ending does imply that the little girl who gets the glasses back got snatched by Ballora, who spent the entire story slowly getting closer to Cassie every time she put on those glasses. She returns the glasses to the woman who owns them, and when her daughter ends up putting them on, she's the one who starts dancing. And knowing this series, I highly doubt it's because she was excited to see a 7 foot tall Ballora dancing right in front of her. Cassie was very nearly caught by Ballora, instead having a little girl take her place. That kid was probably a brat anyway though. I hope it was brave. And at 10, Henry. Now there are many ways to consider Henry a victim of the purple guy, but he's first because not many of them are as direct as others. While we do see Henry get killed by a baby in FNAF World, in the main series games he lives on in FNAF 6, where he then gets burnt in a fire. Unless baby kills him in the FNAF 6 location before the fire can since, you know, he cut her off earlier, but that's still just speculation. However, Henry was also the victim of purple guy's crimes when Charlotte died as seen in FNAF 2. 
2 and 6, as well as in the books, since Henry lost his book daughter Charlie to William when she was only 3 years old. Remember, when someone takes a life, the one who dies isn't the only victim. Their family and friends, anyone who loved them are a victim as well. This also extends to Henry's wife, who we don't know this name of as far as I know, since she may still be alive in the games. And at 9, Gabriel. Gabriel was one of the original 5 missing children from the first ever incident that we learned about in the games. We believe his soul passed into the Freddy animatronic based on the gravestone ending and the placement of the FNAF 3 heads. Gabriel hasn't really ever gotten much of a description, aside from a brief mention in the books, but that description could also be referencing Jeremy, and it's just based on Crying Child from FNAF 4's 8-bit minigames, so there isn't really much validity to it. But I wonder how Gabriel feels about being the mascot of the company in essence. Cause you know, with over 25 versions of the character being present throughout the separate games, you're a pretty popular fellow. I originally had a theory that we played as someone named Gabriel in FNAF VR, since we ended up getting stuffed into the Freddy animatronic in the pizza party ending, but I think that Gregory from Security Breach will be a better Gabriel comparison, especially with this whole hiding in Glamrock Freddy thing. And it ate Susie. Susie was the first to die, which is pretty horrifying when you think about it, but also kinda liberating if you think about it in another way. Horrifying because like, you know, you get killed out of nowhere and that sucks hard, but liberating because while well, yes you're dead, you also dead, so you don't really have to worry about anything else. Well, I suppose not in this case since they go on to possess the animatronic, but like they don't have to worry about anything in their future, like just getting revenge on their killer. And honestly, that sounds like the life. Like not having to pay rent and then just doing everything in your power to stop a serial killer. That sounds like my kind of vacation. But nevertheless, being the first to die is a pretty serious thing. We know she was the first thanks to Withered Chica's voice line in Ultimate Custom Night, and keep in mind that the Withered animatronics are the original ones after being decommissioned when the restaurant closed prior to FNAF 2, since FNAF 2 is still a prequel and one of the first games in the timeline, so she is Withered Chica, even if she's also Chica. Gotta love the games. And it's 7 Fritz. Fritz is also one of the original 5 missing children, being the victim who possesses everyone's favorite animatronic, Foxy. I guess in a way it was meant to be, given that both of their names start with an F and are shorter than their other names. The others actually also have similar names to their animatronics as well. Gabriel has the same amount of leathers as Fazbear, Jeremy has the same amount of letters as Bonnie, and Susie and Chica have the same amount of letters as well. That's freaking weird, man. But not much else is known about Fritz. There originally was a theory that Fritz was a good guy who wanted to help the player in FNAF 1, but that was debunked in Ultimate Custom Night during like an April Fool's update or something where Foxy's mechanics were changed to just like block one of the doors instead of kill you. Like this was actually a joke though, since other mechanics were referencing other theories as well, like Phone Guy being Springtrap, and like, cause well, Springtrap couldn't be moving when Purple Guy was talking, as well as like Nightmare Freddy making you wait wake up from your nightmare, and that was referencing the dream theory. I mean, like, I wish I could wake up from this nightmare, though. Oh wait, this is real? I talk about FNAF on the internet daily. That's actually a thing? I'm not having a nightmare? Oh great. And at 6, Elizabeth. Elizabeth was an unintentional victim of the purple guy, given that Elizabeth was in fact his daughter. In the aftermath of his murder den closing, Afton set up shop in a new restaurant he owned called Circus Baby's Pizza World. At least one that he started opening, where the feature animatronics were actually giant murder robots hungry for the flesh of children. Because, you know, that's what this series has come to at that point. He warned his kids to stay away from the animatronics, especially his daughter Elizabeth, since she had such a fascination with the main star baby, but she didn't listen. So in a moment of ultimate regret, she done got herself scooped, basically insta-killing her while baby's arm grabbed her, pulled her in, and then crushed her and put her in a storage unit. While he didn't kill her directly, he still killed her, and then even victimized himself since, you know, it was his daughter that got scooped, and, and William's also a victim because he killed his daughter. But then, then, this leads him to discover possession at the hands of Agony, but I don't think that he knows that it's Agony, but then that completely changes his motive, so he goes on to commit more murders. It's a pivotal death in the Purple Guy chronology, or what, chronology, or Story. How we doing at number 5, Fritz. Fritz is also one of the original 5 missing children, being the victim who possesses everyone's favorite animatronic, Foxy. Well, everyone else's favorite. My favorite's still Toy Chica specifically, because that one's not possessed. I guess in a way though, it was meant to be, given that both of their names start with F and are shorter than the other names. It, it kind of worked out way too perfectly in, in that sense. The others actually have similar names to their animatronics as well. Gabriel has the same amount of letters as Fazbear, Jeremy has the same 
same amount of letters as Bonnie. Susie and Chica have the same amount of letters too. I don't know, it's freaking weird, man. But the, not much else is known about Fritz, and that's why I'm saying all this jargon. It's to extend the runtime of the video. There originally was a theory that Fritz was going to be a good guy uh, who wanted to help the player in FNAF 1, but that was debunked uh, in Ultimate Custom Night during an April Fool's update where Foxy's mechanics were changed to instead block one of the doors. And then this was also like said to be a joke by Scott, and he also added other mechanics like like having phone guy and spring trap connected, referencing the phone guy's purple guy theory and all that. But considering how Asher Colton Spence has been officially cast in the FNAF movie, I honestly, my first thought when I saw that kid was that he looked like a Fritz. Okay, his name is Asher, but he looks like Fritz. Orange hair for like the most orange animatronic, it makes sense to me. Okay, tell me, look at this kid and tell me that he doesn't look like a Fritz. He certainly looks more like a Fritz than a Gabriel or a Jeremy. Alright, speaking of which, in it for Jeremy. As I've said in multiple videos, Jeremy is the biggest fucking troll name in FNAF history. Being used for three separate characters, none of them being connected, and only two of them are actually direct victims of William Afton. Jeremy is the name of one of the original missing children, and as I said earlier, goes on to possess Bonnie. And the other Jeremy is a playtester for the Freddy Fazbear virtual experience. The one who was testing the game before Tape Girl, who ends up finding Glitch Trap and then goes insane. And by going insane, I mean like genuinely ends up having a psychotic break. Jeremy ends up cutting off his own face, which is interesting given that the withered Bonnie animatronic as seen in FNAF 2 is also missing its face. Huh. I don't know. It's interesting because Withered Bonnie is the animatronic possessed by the missing children's incident Jeremy, and then another Jeremy ended up cutting off his face. Now, I don't think it means anything, or maybe if it, if it was intended or just a coincidence, but knowing the series, I'm worried that the smallest detail can have the biggest consequences. Hopefully, they can explain the recurring name in the movie so that we can all just like take a breather and have that load off of our backs, but I don't know. I, I can't look at people with the name Jeremy the same way anymore. There's a Jeremy in the office. I can't look him in the eye. Straight up. I can't look anyone in the eye, but that's the social anxiety. Getting close to the end of number three, Casey. Casey is the main character in a Fazbear Fright story that I don't think we've talked about much in detail. I might have mentioned the story here and there, but I don't think there's ever been like a whole number on it, except for like one time where I've talked about roughly the same concept. Casey appears in the Fazbear Fright story Dance With Me from Step Closer, the fourth Fazbear Frights book. She ends up stealing some glasses that when worn, either reveal or display a Ballora animatronic dancing. Honestly, this is the first character that I put on the list and the reason that I really wanted this list to happen since the entire story revolves around how she was almost a victim of Ballora. Now, don't get me wrong, the story is very unclear in this regard, but it's generally assumed that the ending does imply that the little girl who gets the glasses back got snatched by Ballora, who spent the entire story slowly getting closer to Casey every time she put on the glasses. She returns the glasses to the woman who owned them, and then when her daughter puts them on, she starts dancing. And knowing the series, I highly doubt that it's because she's excited to see a seven foot tall Ballora animatronic dancing right in front of her. Casey was very nearly caught by Ballora, instead having a little girl take her place, so... Yeah, I hope that she shows up in the FNAF movie because, first of all, Afton absolutely built those glasses because we all know how he felt about Ballora. So, it's still a victim of Purple Guy, still a William Afton victim, so calm your tits in the comments. But, I don't know, I want this explained because, yeah. I've been confused about it. But ultimately, at number two, Susie. Susie was the first to die in the missing children's incident, which is pretty horrifying when you think about it, but also kind of liberating if you think about it in another way. Horrifying because, like, you get killed out of nowhere and that sucks bad, but also liberating because while, yes, you're dead, you're also dead and you don't really have to worry about anything else, okay? Uh, I, I guess, I suppose not in this case, since they go on to possess the animatronics, but like, they don't have to worry about anything in their future, right? Just like, just getting revenge, that's their only purpose. And honestly, that kind of sounds like the life. Not having to pay rent, and just doing everything in your power to stop a serial killer, that's like my kind of vacation. But I digress. Being the first to die is a pretty serious thing. We know that she was the first thanks to Withered Chica's voice line in Ultimate Custom Night. Keep in mind that the Withered animatronics are the original ones uh, after being decommissioned when the restaurant closes prior to FNAF 2, since FNAF 2 is still a prequel and the first games in the time. It's, it's a whole lot. But the withered animatronics are the ones we see in FNAF 1. And considering how the chairs and like the clapperboard seen in the BTS photos say bad cupcake, Susie is a very likely appearance in the movie. Possibly even a focal point. So yeah, maybe this is a love story between Mike and Toy Chica, so I can vicariously live through him. And finally, in number one, Crying Child. 
Okay, now this one is certainly going to be a bit controversial. There's going to be people mad at me in the comments. But there is no way that I could have done this list without mentioning one of the greatest debates of my DMs ever. The amount of people who message me on Instagram on a regular basis about the bite of 83 and how it ha wasn't William's fault bothers me to my core. They also keep saying that it's the bite of 87. It's not. Okay, it, they're two different things. I say this every time I bring it up though, the bite of 83 is not a spring lock failure. It could not have been. The reason I know it wasn't a spring lock failure is because the Fredbear suit was already in animatronic mode, meaning no spring locks could have had a chance of failing, since a spring lock failure refers to when the mechanisms are being forced to stay open, and then the failure is when they close on you when you're inside the suit, okay? Plus, there's no spring lock mechanisms in the jaw, and it just, it, it wouldn't need it. Anyway, because like the jaw just moves up and down. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know what else to say. It would have had to be super powered in order to actually crush a skull, something that only William would be able to integrate, considering how he made the robots and is the suit technician. All right, it's fairly cut and dry at this point. I don't know why people are still yelling at me in my DMs, but it's it, it's happening. I don't know. It could have been that he planned on using the Fredbear suit first as like his murder suit, and then his son got killed in it, and then he was like, eh, yeah, maybe not, but. Who knows? In at 10, Elizabeth Afton. Elizabeth is at the top of this list because, well, she got killed, but she also doesn't really seem to deserve it until after she gets killed. And then she deserves the spring locking. Which, I mean, in a way makes sense, and it's something that I've been using as evidence when it comes to who I think the vengeful spirit is. Because, you know, spirits, when they're, uh, you know, being spirits for longer periods of time, would understandably start to go crazy, or even crazier. And this is an idea that's supernatural Natural, the the show has used in length and the same idea though could be applying to Elizabeth and crying child Just because you start off good or loving your father doesn't mean that you'll continue to see things that way in a few years time And Elizabeth while not deserving a spring locking in 1983 when she dies definitely deserves one come sister location in FNAF 6 I mean she literally betrays her brother and sister location nearly killing him and then again She also betrayed him and then in FNAF 6 she wants to make her father proud her murderous, psychopathic father. She wants to make him proud. Considering how you've been possessing an animatronic um, that he made that caused you uh, to die, that he made, I think that you would have already made him pretty proud, I guess. It's a damn shame that you turned into this, but whatever. In at nine, Mr. Hippo. Okay, this is kind of a joke number, but also not, because Mr. Hippo is literally the worst thing ever in Ultimate Custom Night. Mr. Hippo is a viable animatronic from FNAF 6 that returns as an antagonist in Ultimate Custom Night. Okay, Mr. Hippo will climb through the duct systems trying to reach one of the two hoses in the office. Hoses? Is that right? I don't know. I just copied and pasted that line from the wiki. The player needs to use an audio lure to keep him in place and to move him around so that they can use the heater to push him back, and he is he is fooled 100% of the time by the audio lure. Also, is fooled faster than Helpy Frog. However, most of the scare factor from this animatronic doesn't come from their behavior or their design. This time around, rather, their death lines. Because you see, Mr. Hippo has a knack for going on about things. A lot. Okay, it's like me on a first date. Still, he will go into like five minute long speeches that you have to deal with every time he kills you. Meaning that if you get jump scared, you're boned for enough time to make a sandwich, okay? Which is annoying as hell. Getting killed by him enough will eventually and cause you to end up agreeing with me that he needs to be spring locked. Because you end up knowing what comes after the smoke of the jump scare clears and it's just pain. In at eight, Roxy. Okay, I know that Roxy and Mr. Hippo are animatronics and incapable of actually feeling pain because of a spring locking, but honestly, I also just hate this kind of person. This The self-centered tool bag who only cares about themselves, whether they secretly hate themselves or not, that's not what matters here, okay? Who you are and what kind of person you are is defined by how you treat others and who you are when the pressure is on. And Roxy is just horrible. And while they may not be able to feel pain, from the spring locking, at least Roxy will be contained if they got spring locked, okay? And honestly, that's what I need. I don't want to deal with this personality type. I've dealt with enough people like this throughout my life, and I'm still only 22 goddamn years old, which means that I'm really fed up with this shit. So yeah, there's, there's not much else to say with this one other than I want her to be restrained so that I don't have to deal with her. Uh, so yeah, that's it. That's the number. What are you still doing here?
Go to the next one. And it's Seven Cassidy. Some say that Cassidy was spring locked, but honestly, there isn't really much evidence for that. Uh, but you know what? If she wasn't, she damn well deserves to be. And why, you ask? How could like a, how could a little girl who got killed and then go on to possess the killer so he could suffer for all eternity deserve such a fate as a spring locking? Well, exactly for the reason you listed. Because everyone thinks that Cassidy is the vengeful spirit, aka the one you should not have killed, aka the one who possessed Zapton to make him suffer. But when you look at it, Logically, taking into consideration more than just what Matt Patton says, it would make more sense for Crying Child to be the vengeful spirit. But nobody wants to listen to me. Nobody wants to hear even my suggestions because of Cassidy. The amount of hate that I have gotten in the comments, in my DMs, on TikTok for God's sakes, is more than I have gotten for anything else. Even more than I got for suggesting that Michael was a Crying Child robot. Just because William didn't kill Crying Child directly does not mean that he couldn't possibly blame the man who made the robot and gave it enough power to crush a skull for his death. Which all- cause, you know, that wouldn't normally be required. Plus, Cassidy only has significance because you think she's the vengeful spirit. Take that away, and what importance does she have? Exactly. So, just for that, and for hardly anyone being willing to even hear me out, Cassidy damn well deserves it. Honestly, she could be higher on the list, but I wanted to rant about other people a little bit more. So yeah, there you go. And it's six FNAF cops. The cops in the FNAF universe are absolutely the most moronic bunch of people I have ever I guess not seen, but heard of, honestly. Like, yeah, I get that they couldn't catch William for story purposes, but that seemingly was retconned, since in the first game they said that they had made an arrest. They could have ended it right there. The story could have been over, but they couldn't find the body, so they let him go. Yeah, ignore the animatronics that smell like death, are leaking blood and other bodily fluids, and that many parents have compared to reanimated corpses. Those don't have anything to do with this scenario. Yeah, totally. And even when they find baby's blueprints and see that she has a child storage tank, they don't do anything more than question him. Quote, There's no doubting what you've achieved on a technical level. These are clearly state of the art. There are just certain design choices that were made for these robots that we don't fully understand. We were hoping that you could shed some light on those. Dude, arrest him! <laughs> And search the bloody, rotten body smelling animatronics. God damn it, how hard is this? Okay, if it's a crime scene or a suspected crime scene, you, you, come on. If it's a crime scene, you don't ha need to have a warrant, for fuck's sakes. Okay, they all deserve spring lockings for the sheer stupidity alone. I'm surprised that they didn't crawl into one and then get killed by it just because they're that damn stupid. Arrgh. Halfway through into number five, Matthew. Remember how earlier I talked about how Springtrap was killing himself in the Springtrap's Revenge VR game in the Fazbear Frights book Bunny Call? Well, not only does he do that, but he also tears the main character Matthew to shreds. Now, some do consider this Matthew to be a reference to Matt Pat of Game Theory, and it makes sense why. But what makes this bad is that the community considers this an M. Preg fan fiction, which I have to say, I enjoyed not knowing what that was until I had to ask my sister about it because it was everywhere online. She's really into fan fiction, it's kind of concerning. Anyway, basically Matthew in this story gets implanted with a baby spring trap thanks to a program called It's a Boy.exe, which literally ends up tearing him to shreds from the inside out. Hardly a fun experience, I would say. Yet some women go their whole lives wanting to give birth and have kids. But I mean, at least most of the time, they don't kill you from the inside out. Or, or rather, they don't usually claw at you and dig through your stomach. That's exclusive to Springtrap. I hope. And at four, Henry. Henry is another case that is kind of like victim adjacent. And and not in a sense where he was a victim because he killed Charlie like I said last time, but rather because Henry lets himself die in FNAF 6 in order to ensure that nobody remembers what William did. However, William does end up escaping, but Henry stayed put and let himself burn in the FNAF 6 fire because of Springtrap. And then it turned out that it was all for nothing because nobody is standing in his way anymore. So honestly, while not directly killed by Springtrap or William, Henry is one of the biggest victims that William has. He took his family and his life, all for nothing, since it didn't actually put an end to his reign of terror. But maybe, like the ultimate custom night Samurai Freddy cutscene suggests, maybe Henry is also still alive, possessing an object looking to come back to keep pursuing that anime fox. At least, I wouldn't be surprised if Henry turned out to be Glamrock Freddy or something like that. 
getting close to the end and in number three, Gregory. Now with Security Breach not releasing until late 2021, we can only speculate as to what happens to our next main character and our player Gregory in the next Fazbear game. However, it's entirely possible that Gregory ends up getting killed. Think about it. This is literally a kid who is fighting one of the FNAF universe's deadliest child serial killers, who has multiple animatronics out to find him and control over a security guard. Not only that, but it's entirely possible that Glamrock Freddy ends up betraying us and crushing us while we're inside of him. That sounded weird. It's not like we haven't been killed in the games before, or at least horribly mutilated like we were in Sister Location. And we as the player die in FNAF 6 along with Henry. So Scott is not new to killing off the main player in his games. But also, realistically, he's a kid. And like, what's he gonna be able to do against a literal sentient code? And if he lives, there will be someone to tell the cops what happened. And if William was paying them off, he certainly wasn't anymore, so maybe they can have an actual investigation this time. But only if Gregory lives, so he's, he's probably gonna die. And ultimately in at number two, Michael Afton. Now this may be confusing to some of you since Michael doesn't die until FNAF 6, but come on, this guy is the biggest Springtrap victim of them all. Let's just recap what happens to Springtrap's own son for God's sake. He kills his brother, assuming that's actually what happened. He then learns about his father's killing spree and tries to right his wrongs. While doing so, he is haunted by the spirits of the children his father has killed. And then learns about how his sister has possessed an animatronic after getting scooped so many years ago. Then he learns that he is probably a robot and gets ripped open by a scooping machine. After this, a giant robot amalgamation of parts fills his body and lets him bruise and rot while wearing him like a suit after Barney Stinson had a mental breakdown. And then he vomits that entire animatronic back out. Can you imagine how painful that would be? The seven foot tall mass that is entered coming out of your throat. But somehow, he's still alive. Then he finds a job posting about a new Fazbear location and applies for it, but then has to salvage animatronics that include the thing that ruined his body, his long dead sister, one of his father's earliest victims, and his father, all of which may kill him if he's not on high alert. This man has suffered probably the most in the entire series. That's absolutely horrifying. Finally, in at number one, William Afton. Yes, here we are again. While I already said Springtrap himself as the first number, I'm gonna round it off with some more self-reflection. Like I said, this list was hard. However, the most important victim Springtrap could have had would have been William Afton himself. Let's remember, Springtrap isn't a separate character. He is the body of William Afton that got springlocked after he hastily put on his murder costume in the back room of an early Fazbear location after accidentally releasing the souls of his original victims. Whether it was to make them feel scared or to make himself feel more powerful, his haste coupled with the moisture from the leaking ceiling caused the springlock mechanisms to fail, shooting thousands of metal parts deep into his body. It would have killed him if not for the spirit that had possessed him that was intentionally keeping him alive. That's brutal. I mean, he absolutely deserves it, don't get me wrong, but that has to be included on this list. I mean, I was told that William should have been on the purple guy victims list, so there you go. Here he is. In at 10, Henry. While Henry does ultimately perish thanks to the FNAF 6 fire, he would have been a target for William beforehand, especially once he had learned who was actually committing the crimes at his restaurants. But why didn't William go after him? It would have been too obvious, really. I mean, there are five murders that occur inside the walls of the restaurant. They already suspect William for it. But then Henry goes missing and then William is left as the sole proprietor of the business? That's super suspicious and would definitely result in an arrest. Motive means an opportunity. Motive is absolutely there, especially if William was cheating with Henry's wife or something, means would be fairly easy to find and William has plenty of opportunities, let's be honest. So killing Henry would only result in William going to jail, which probably saved Henry's life. And at 9, Vanny. Vanny is an interesting case here, because while she is in a way a victim of glitch trap, she doesn't really know it, or at least is unable to communicate it, only being able to search help on the company computer. Not only that, but William could very well have killed Vanny, but he didn't, opting instead to gain partial control over her. So while she isn't a victim in the traditional sense, I'm sure that there are people who are willing to argue in the comments. So I'm going to make this simple. My list, my rules. Plus, this is a really hard list. There 
aren't many people who don't end up dying in the FNAF universe, alright? So cut me some slack if a couple of these numbers are iffy to say the least. But Vanny has not yet suffered the ultimate fate of the Forever Naps, so I'm allowing myself to say that she was almost a victim. Does that mean she isn't going to die? No, I feel like she almost certainly will perish, but she hasn't yet, and that's good enough for me. And it ate Sammy Emily. Another one that kind of fits if you squint at it and then cough a couple of times. Sammy Emily was in the first two FNAF novels, Charlie's twin brother who was kidnapped and killed by William Afton. We as the reader and Charlie believe this to be the case for the Silver Eyes as well as the Twisted Ones. However, in The Fourth Closet, the third and final book in the novel trilogy, we learn that there is no Sammy Emily. That instead, Charlie was the one who was kidnapped and killed by Afton. And that for all these years, every version of Charlie had been a robot designed by Henry and implanted with fake memories. So technically, since Sammy Emily isn't real, they aren't a victim. And if we want to get even more meta with it, they were almost a victim because Scott could have decided to let the story stay that way and not make Charlie a robot. But he didn't. Sure, Sammy could have been a real character. That, or if Sammy was real, they would have been a victim, meaning that since it didn't happen, they were almost a victim. Like I said, this list was hard, but I promise the next ones make more sense. And it's seven, Lewis. Lewis was introduced in FNAF AR through emails that he's lucky he's the only one seeing, and not HR. Lewis is a creepy co-worker of Ness who works at IT, at the company creating all the robots for the Fazbear Entertainment Delivery Service that we experience in Special Delivery. And he's probably the creepiest damn character in the entire series. Honestly, I'm surprised he hasn't been killed, especially if Ness is indeed Vanessa and Vanny, since he seems to be on to their little scheme. He's intercepted search queries and emails that just make Ness seem off, and straight up like a serial killer. Didn't she order, like, realistic human masks at some point? Anyway, if William had seen these emails addressed to Ness, he would feel required to take matters into his own hands and get rid of the guy who keeps spying on them. Unless this would be a similar situation to Henry, where the cops would look at these emails and see that he was harassing Ness and then maybe take her in for questioning. I mean, it's a realistic scenario. Ness feels threatened or annoyed by Lewis and then just gets rid of him. People have killed for less. And the contents of those emails is only more incriminating. Like, who orders realistic human faces? Aside from me. <laughs> and at 6, Indie Game Dev. The Scott Cawthon in-universe stand-in is an interesting character I hope they explore more in the future. But with Scott retiring, could this character meet a grisly fate? It could be that Fazbear Entertainment wants to tie up loose ends while trying to to rebuild their reputation, or that maybe they threatened him into making the games in the first place, so they're keeping a close watch on him. I mean, if William learns about what this guy was making, maybe he would feel like he needs to silence the one man who knows too much, or strong arm him into creating the games after he learned that he knew about the real story behind Fazbear Entertainment. It's entirely possible. It could also be that the indie game dev was the person the FNAF 6 franchise owner job was for, since there was a way out planned for them, and Henry knew at least one other person that knew what was going on. But that person wasn't Michael, as we learned from the final speech, meaning that whoever that was, was almost a victim as well. And to you, my brave volunteer, who somehow found this job listing not intended for you. I fight through in at number 5, Vanny. Vanny is kind of a different victim, in the sense that she isn't dead, but she has been controlled by Afton in the form of a mind virus that is just pretty damn ridiculous even for the FNAF series. But presumably getting caught by testing the FNAF AR game, or maybe through FNAF AR, she gets partially controlled by William. Hence the potential double personality that we see as hinted at through the FNAF AR emails. But this could also just be Tape Girl that we hear in FNAF VR, who is the one who gives you false information about how to beat Glitch Trap. Vanny we know is a victim of the purple guy since, well, he's been the only killer in the series up until this point, and she wears a fabric bunny suit, alluding to the fact that William and had his spring bonnie suit and it turned him into spring trap and you know, little glitch trap thing. Gotta love them parallels. This is how serial killers are caught though. Like change your MO every once in a while. They only catch the stupid criminals, so don't be stupid. I mean, I mean, don't be a criminal. Especially, just, just don't do it. And at four, Jeremy's. As I said in the Souls Trapped in Animatronics video, Jeremy is one of the biggest troll names in FNAF history, being used for three separate characters, which, I mean, doesn't sound like a lot, but for FNAF it is. However, only two of them are the direct victims of Purple Guy. Jeremy is the name of one of the original missing children, and as I said earlier, he goes on to possess Bonnie. The other Jeremy is a playtester for the Freddy Fazbear Virtual Experience, the game we tested in FNAF VR, the one who tested it before Tape Girl, who ends up finding the glitch trap in 
anomaly and causes him to go mad. And by going mad, I genuinely mean like absolutely psycho. Jeremy ends up cutting off his own face. But I mean like that's also interesting because like Withered Bonnie, the Withered Bonnie animatronic that we see in FNAF 2 is missing his face. And it's weird because Withered Bonnie is the Bonnie that's possessed by the missing children's incident Jeremy. Now like I don't know if that means anything or if it's just if it's intended or if it's just coincidence but knowing this series I'm always worried that like the smallest detail is gonna have the biggest consequence. And at three, Cassidy. Cassidy is probably who you'd expect to be number one on this list. You know, the generally assumed, the one you should not have killed. The missing children's victim who went on to possess Golden Freddy. Cassidy is described in the novels as a young girl with long black hair, which is also the description of the only human to appear in the FNAF survival logbook. Or or security logbook, I call it both. The name Cassidy was also discovered in that book. When a Reddit theorist going by the username dpowerful1 took wrong or highlighted numbers from various pages and put those into word search and basic like in coordinates and then he ended up finding the name Cassidy, which has got to be the most complicated thing in history. Like we dig through Saurus code and we put audio files through goddamn spectrograms to try to find clues, but even this was too much for this series. Like I don't know why I had to go and make things so complicated. And ultimately in at number two, Charlotte. Charlotte is one of the most troublesome victims Purple Guy has had. Being the sixth victim, Charlotte gets killed outside the pizzeria, despite desperate attempts from her father Henry to prevent this, mainly by creating a security animal animatronic designed like a puppet to protect other kids but treat her as a priority. You know, he's a parent, I get it. However, when it gets trapped in its box, it's unable to make it out to Charlotte in time to save her. So in another attempt, the puppet saves her in another way, allowing her agony to reach out and take hold of the animatronic. As the puppet, Charlotte then goes on to share her gift of the second chance with the other animatronics, bringing them to life as well, resulting in William's ultimate undoing. In a way, Charlotte is really the one you should not have killed, since if he had spared her, maybe he wouldn't have lost his life in the end, or been, been springlocked. So, yeah, shouldn't have done it. Finally, in at number one, us. Now, this is why Cassidy isn't number one. No matter what, we are a victim of the purple guy, and not in any philosophical way either. We are a direct victim of the purple guy, or William Afton, or Glitch Trap, or whatever you want to call him. Since, thanks to FNAF VR, no matter what you do, you end up losing at the end of the game. You either merge with him and join him on stage, or you complete the ritual only to get locked away in your own mind as William walks free in your body, or the easier one, we get stuffed into Freddy at the end of the pizza party minigame. But if you end up collecting all 16 tapes and actually fully complete the game, you're you're a victim of the purple guy. Like he uses your body to commit whatever comes next. I mean, we could be Vanny, we could be Tape Girl giving it another shot, we could be some random bystander. But either way, we the player get gotten by this toxic, poisonous grip that is the purple guy. So yeah, I'm gonna put myself at number one.